Hi, I'm Dave from Sailing Laguna. Soon to be Sailing Nothing, but more on that later. Last episode, we had a bit of a detailed look at how we dealt with Hurricane Elsa in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It finished with us, and several other boats for that matter, being stuck in quarantine for 10 days before rushing to the airport in Grenada as the family flew home to Australia. Now, the first half of this video is going to be all about the experiences and sights there are, is to see in Grenada, and the second half will be a little bit more specific um, with references to boat life and as such. So, starting in the water, one of Grenada's greatest attractions is the underwater sculpture park just to the north of St. George's. Don't forget your VHF or phone and take the tender northwest of St. George past the wonky building that may or may not still be there and you'll find yourself at the point where the sculpture park is. As you can see, the water was not quite as clear as that in the Bahamas, but it was still plenty clear enough to see a range of interesting underwater monuments. In all, there's about 50 sculptures uh, at depths of around 5 to 8 metres, um, and it's, but it's actually not as easy as what you would think to be able to find them all. Um, I'm certain I missed a few, but I guess that only provides you know, me with more reasons as to why I should return on another day and to con continue to try and look for them all. Underwater sculpture parks have been real great attractions uh, during our time in the Caribbean, and I'd highly recommend any tourist spot to stick some sculptures down there because uh, because it really does provide an attraction to an area. My first actual touristy sort of day trip um, and Grenada adventure was off to the popular Belmont Estate Chocolate Factory. They gave a great tour of the old machines and techniques used in the chocolate making process and how and highlighted how some of these are still used today. We got to taste some of their products while in the state of the art chocolate making factory and they also showed us a large range of tropical fruits, fruits that you don't typically see in supermarkets back home. We then headed off to Mount Caramel Falls um, and you may have to pay a few dollars to someone to walk down uh, between some of the buildings, but, you know, that's okay. You will then see um, the larger waterfall, which is further upstream. The waterfalls in Grenada are so great for providing that cool, refreshing dip that one desires in a tropical climate. Uh, downstream here at Mount Caramel uh, is a smaller sort of natural water slide, but just as usual, inspect the waters before taking the, the leap. It did look a little rough uh, for my bottom, so I didn't give it a go, but it didn't, didn't seem to bother some of the kids, and they seemed to have a ball. And I guess speaking of the kids, it was a real shame actually that Cooper and Campbell had gone home and missed out on all this fun. This would have been a lifelong memory, playing with all the other kids. Um, we really didn't meet a super lot of kids on our whole caravan adventure and so meeting all these kids here really could have made a difference for their enjoyment. Anyway, there's also a ledge next to the slide that's great for jumping off. It was so good that we could have spent the entire day here. Um, if you're wondering, there are some roadside sort of food and drink vendors at the top of the hill um, in case you didn't want to bring a packed lunch. But yeah, really try and factor in a few hours at this location. Day tour number two was with Kim and uh, Rikus. We headed up to the Grand Atang Lake and National Park. At the top of the hill is a visitor's centre where you can read, or they'll actually tell you, all about Grenada. But the real reason people visit Grand Atang is for the monkeys. Just as we pulled onto the lane that leads down towards the lake, we found a tour group using some banana treats to lure the monkeys out of the trees. 
being wild, they did take a bit of coaxing, um, and it helps to sort of make the monkey grunting, to make a monkey grunting sound, like, um, and no, the locals weren't taking the piss out of me, it really did help. Um, of course, it also helps not to give the monkey too much food, or they'll, of course, lose interest in the process once they're full. Anyway, it's a great stop on one of your day tours, and in fact, you could actually stop at this place almost every time you did a day tour, um, just to make sure that you do actually see and get to experience the monkeys. I actually returned here with Mike and Dee from True North as well, because it was such a great place to stop. Anyway, the next stop on a suggested day tour is another actual chocolate factory, the Grenada Chocolate Factory. Now, this is not really set up for tourists like the Belmont Estate, but they still gave us a bit of a rundown on the process. However, the real reason why I wanted to go here was because I had read or heard somewhere that they will point you in the direction of an old plantation slave estate. So just down the road is an entrance to the bush and so head along the path and you'll come across the most amazing old homestead. I was told that it currently has sort of a North American owner, but they don't appear to have any interest in restoring it to its former glory. Um, it's, a, it's a real shame because it's such a grand building. Anyway, I didn't come here just to see the old building. This site is on the map because of the slave pen. Slavery took place here up until the 1830s. The slaves which were purchased or just taken from Africa were transported to Grenada and many were kept in these horrible jail-like pens. It's hard to comprehend how a human being could withstand the conditions. The Grenadian humidity, a lack of ventilation, no breeze, of 15 to 20 people they reckon were locked inside this slave pen sort of overnight. Um, and of course this is all after they did a back-breaking day's work. It's just awful stuff but also very important to learn and remind ourselves about mankind's mistakes from the past. So, after Grand Atang, and of course the Grenada Chocolate Factory and the Slave Pen, you'd be ready for a cool swim under a waterfall, which Grenada certainly has no shortage of. Another person I met was uh, Tim, um, who I got to meet in Grenada, and before he went home for hurricane break, he organised an island tour. One of the places we visited was Concord Waterfalls. Tim had organised Shade Man to ferry us through the lush green hills of Grenada up to the cool heights of the mountains. Concord Waterfalls is yet another great place to swim and cool off. It even has a few ledges you can jump off. Some are a little bit lower and some are a little bit higher and I've even heard people can even jump off the railing if you can see it there. Right next to the waterfall is a homestead or maybe even sort of slash restaurant which would be a great spot for a late lunch. Of course the restaurant wasn't really operating when we were there because again remember we were there just sort of before the real tourists had returned after the COVID pandemic. Okay, I promise this is the last waterfall in the video. Well, kind of. Uh, Annandale Waterfalls is the perfect spot to finish off any tour or even just to travel to for a lazy lunch, an afternoon session on the beers. It's closer to St George and has an excellent restaurant bar sort of right next to it. In fact, I'm sure it's a great place at night as well. Annandale Waterfalls is as refreshing as you would expect. But there was a local who seemed like he occasionally made some money by jumping off for tourists as I didn't want to encourage something that even I considered was way too dangerous. And actually by the lack of the front teeth that he had, um, it seemed as though he might have misjudged a few of his jumps in his lifetime. So yeah, didn't want to encourage that one. But yeah, Annandale Waterfalls, lovely restaurant bar right next to the waterfalls. Awesome spot. So 
some more highly recommended adventure activities to do while in Grenada is the river tubing. I actually made a standalone video on that that I'll load up onto YouTube. A shade man, the van operator, basically organized the day where we gave him the numbers. I think he had a minimum of like eight. And he booked the river tubing followed by lunch. He was also the go-to man for the hash. On Saturday afternoons, people gather together to negotiate a preset course through the Grenadian countryside. It's most similar to a cross-country event, but the terrain is really quite challenging in spots. On one afternoon hash, the course was so steep that you had to use a rope to, lo to lower yourself down uh, the hill. And at other times, you'd need to actually get on all fours um, to make it up some slippery slopes and sort of like jab your hands into the mud to try and get grip enough to get up. Um, the hash was a really great challenge and, and a good bit of exercise too. The hash enabled me to gain such a great appreciation for the Grenadian countryside. Of course, it's followed by a few beers and a feed of chicken, um, which of course I highly recommend. And again, the hash was so good that I made a few standalone videos on them, so yeah, check those out as well. Speaking of standalone videos, I also made one of the Seven Sisters waterfall. Yeah, I know, another waterfall. Uh, you can complete the medium grade walk to see the main waterfall or you can follow the path that I show you to the more extreme adventure of experiencing all seven. But I do warn you in the video that to do the seven sisters waterfalls, like all seven, um, you really need to be quite a robust and sort of adventure type of person. And the jump at the end, it's quite a big jump too. Now, I can't talk about the highlights of Grenada without talking about the island of Karakou. I met up with SV Velocity and SV Atmospheric, who were actually an Australian family sailing the Caribbean around the same time that we were. Um, we met at an anchorage right next to Kikum Jenny, the underwater volcano, before making our way up to the island of Karakou. Well, actually, Sandy Island. Sandy Island is a great little island, which has some of the best snorkeling in the Caribbean that I've seen. I actually really enjoyed diving down with the GoPro and setting it up overlooking a section of coral. Um, it's something that I'm really disappointed that I didn't start doing earlier. Just sort of leaving the GoPro on the bottom uh, for a few minutes and allowing this natural sea life to return to the coral head. It was really quite interesting looking at the footage in, in retrospect. You really start to appreciate the sea life that's present in this type of environment. And so I highly recommend it. Again, I've actually done up a whole video with just this footage and sort of no talking. So yeah, look out for that as well in the coming, the coming um, posts. Okay, well, here we are in Anse La Ronche at the northern end of Karakou. Uh, so this bay is a lovely little bay here. It's got this little rocky outcrop, as you can see, um, which has got a bunch of different wildlife. I actually set the GoPro up there the other day and just let it film the little family of lobsters that are there and a bunch of other sort of corals that are around. Um, it's, not, it's not as clear as the water down at Sandy Island, but it's, you know, it's definitely worth a snorkel. Now the beach here, lovely little beach, uh, quite deep all the way up, so you can actually anchor a lot closer than what I'm anchored here at the moment. Um, and in actual fact, if you want to med more, you can also med more here, which is, of course is one of the best things that you can possibly do just to jump off the back into nice, uh, clear, you know, sandy type of uh, environment in the water there. Um, there's also a little beach bar. Uh, it's pretty expensive for dinner, um, but they do have drinks and stuff, I guess, that you could have as well. Uh, and so there's also some snorkeling uh, up at the northern end there as well. Um, it's not the snorkeling and the corals are not quite as good as what they are at Sandy Island. The water is a little bit cloudy when the wind blows in. Um, if you have a few still days, you might get better clarity of water. But uh, yeah, Anse La Ronche. And as you can see here, you can probably hear because the dead mic's not really working too well. But there's a fair breeze blowing today, maybe 25 knots. Um, and you can see from the east, and so it's, there's only a little bit of the waves wrapping around the corner, so the boat's not rocking too much at all. Anyway, yeah, I, uh, I do rate this anchorage, so if you're ever in this part of the world, then 
come on and check out Ants La Ronche at Karakou. I then headed around the corner to Umbrella or Morpian Island, which is just to the northwest of Petite St. Vincent. And yes, technically I'm illegally in another country, but, I, but only just. This is an iconic island that I just had to visit. Now, being fully exposed to the trade winds, it would be best to visit this island where there, when there's one of those very rare still days, but sometimes you've just got to do what you've got to do. I'll have to mention this concept uh, in the wrap-up video, like in terms of utilising opportunities, whether that be still conditions or wind directions that are out of the ordinary, um, look for those types of days to and try and use them to your advantage. Alright, well, here we are. Uh, after four weeks of living on the boat by myself, I can now officially say I am a solo sailor. We've got 18 knots from about 120 degrees, so we've got lovely conditions out here. A bit of swell, as you can see, but we're currently island hopping down through the Caribbean. Uh, we're just passing Kickham Jenny, which is the underwater volcano, just about five miles over that way behind those islands. And this afternoon should see us coming into Grenada, which you might be able, just be able to see off there in the distance. Anyway, this is living, Barry. This is living. Okay, well, that brings me to the liverboard sailor side of Grenada. The biggest marina is the um, Port Louis Marina, the Camper and Nichols, at St George. It's got several hundred berths, but does book out for hurricane season, so plan ahead. Apart from all the usual marina facilities, most essentially it has a rather refreshing pool, there's a supermarket and marine chandlery, uh, the island water world nearby, which is super handy. And of course, being in town, it also means that there's regular buses that pass by in case you want to head out to, to other places. In St George, there's also the Yacht Club that has berths available and an anchorage outside the main harbour. However, there are plans to turn this into a paid mooring field, so that could be different by the time you're watching this video. I actually only spent a couple of nights at Port Louis Marina. I would spend actually Monday to Thursday in a place called Prickly Bay on the other side of the island, um, where not only could I anchor out for free, but Budget Marine has a free tender dock right there as well. Now don't judge, don't judge, I spent lots of money at Budget Marine, don't worry about that. I could, uh, from the free tender dock, I could then walk up to the main road and I could jump on a bus to go to the gym or suck up the air conditioning and pick up some supplies at the IGA supermarket. Um, some days I would sneak into Port Louis and, and visit the pool um, or even one of the west side beaches, which are quite nice places to hang out. These are just some of the benefits of being located near the number one bus route. All right, well, I'm just across from the uh, bus stop, as you can see over there. There goes a bus right now. A bus is basically a uh, like a 12-seater minivan. Now, catching a bus in Grenada is a little bit like, well, I've never done it, but taking speed and going to a busy nightclub. And I think it's the, about the same experience because, A, the speed type of things, when you jump in the minibus, even though the speed limit is 40 kilometres an hour, you're going to basically be doing about 80, or as fast as the minibus will go. In fact, even to the point where if it's a two-lane road then and there's a bus stopped in front of the bus you're on, then they'll basically create a third lane and just drive head-on in towards the oncoming traffic until the t they find a tourist in a hire car. And they know the tourist, of course, there goes another bus. They know the tourist, of course, will uh, basically careen off the side of the road to get out of the road so they don't have a head-on. So that's the speed side of things. I mean, even going around turns, sometimes I've thought that the tyres are actually going to roll off the rims as this minivan rolls over to the side and it goes around the turn. It's crazy stuff. Uh, the packed nightclub, 
Well, that comes down to how many people they're gonna fit in this 12-seater minivan. In Australia, yes, we'd call it a 12-seater minivan. Here, they'd say that it's got 20 seats. Now, you'll be jam-packed in there, especially if you go to the bus stop. They won't leave before you have 20 people in these little, there they are, in the little minivan. Um, and even to the point where if they find the 21st or 22nd person to try and cram in there, then the conductor will actually just basically crouch in the front somewhere and just sort of make his own type of seating arrangements. So yeah, catching a bus in Grenada is quite the experience. Prickly Bay also gives you access to the container park where all the uni students hang out and to the dodgy dock, which looks like a restaurant, but in many people's experiences, has trouble actually delivering food to tables. Uh, here I'm actually celebrating being served a bucket of beers. I, I gave up waiting for our order and just had to go to the bar and pick them up. On the other side of Prickly Bay is Prickly Bay Marina, which also has uh, nightly meal specials and entertainment, as well as a few other businesses like laundromats and convenience stores. So yeah, there's lots of facilities around the Prickly Bay area. All right, well, here we are at one end of Prickly Bay. So Prickly Bay has got uh, the Spice Island Marina here, so you can haul out, of course, get work done on your boat. Um, there's the One Love restaurant there, which has actually some really quite cheap food at the moment. Um, we're talking sort of like, it's, what, 16 EC for a burger and fries. So that's about, you know, $5 US for a burger and fries, which is quite decent. Um, and then there's also, of course, Budget Marine is in there behind uh, One Love restaurant as well. And Budget Marine is a good, cheap channelry that has lots of things that liveaboard cruisers want. So this is one side of Prickly Bay. And, well, that answered where I was Monday to sort of Thursday, but where was I from Thursday to Sunday? Well, I'd actually head around to Hog Island or Woburn Bay. Hog Island is the local sort of sailor's hangout. Um, there's kids' boat school a couple of mornings a week. Uh, there's music jam sessions go on on the beach here, or people just lazing about or sunning themselves and having a swim um, there at Hog Island. There's also Rogers Beach Bar. It is a very simple beach bar, but... Yeah, they, they do put on some big concerts sometimes. Woburn Bay has Clark's Court Marina, which offers some of the best hurricane shelter for boats on the hard, there's Whisper Cove Marina, which has, say, a dozen berths, but it's really a bar and restaurant that's regu that regularly has entertainment on for the sailors. Woburn Bay also gives you access, if it's still going, to a Thursday afternoon touch football, um, which is promoted, of course, on the sailor's net. It's just down the road from Nimrod's Rum Shack. And speaking of Nimrod's, well, it's pretty much a simple Caribbean bar, sort of almost run out of the back of someone's house. Um, but it's actually really famous for its open mic nights, which I think are also on Thursday, and, and in busy times, I think they also run another one through the week too. Some other notable venues uh, over on this Woborn Bay sort of area is the Lafar Blue Marina, which is a reasonably sized marina with pool and, um, and various conveniences and stores and things. Um, it's rather popular with families, but it's not located on a bus route, so yeah, it's hard to get back into town and everything from that location. Um, there's also to the south, there's Secret Harbour Marina, which again has a restaurant and, and entertainment occasionally, but doesn't have the convenient links to town via the bus route. Of course, if you've got a bit of coin and you're going to rent a car for hurricane season while you're in Grenada, then the bus routes are probably not important to you and you can look at staying at these uh, more secluded sort of marinas, and boutique maybe marinas.
So why did I stay behind when my family went home? Insurance. Our Pantaneous insurance didn't cover us against a hurricane in Grenada. So I wanted to stay with the boat in case it had to be moved out of the road of a hurricane, well, again. So one of the first things I did was check out a good hurricane hole just in case. All right, well, here we are in Ergmont Harbour. Um, this is one of the best hurricane holes in Grenada. Um, you can see that no one's really, there's not many people that are actually tied up in preparation for a hurricane here because there's nothing on the horizon. Um, and many people don't hang out here permanently because there's no real facilities here. Um, Le, Le Fleur Bleu is the marina, it's a little bit over that way. There is a main road, it's a little bit of a hike up the hill, but there's no marina, there's no grocery stores, um, there's not much in this harbour besides protection from a hurricane if it was to come along. As mentioned in the last episode, we put our boat up for sale when we reached Grenada. Without using a broker, there were three main ways that we advertised the boat for sale. Facebook was probably one of the most important. We posted it for sale on pages like Sale Boat for Sale by Owner. Um, there's a few of them actually out there, which would contain a link to one of the two web listings on sailboat listings, and we also listed on the catamaran site. We then got a bunch of inquiries and we arranged a video walkthrough for one of the potential buyers while, while we were actually still in, in quarantine on the boat. They were really keen and after a couple of days made a full price offer. However, it took six weeks to book in a surveyor in Grenada. Usually if the locals are busy, you could just fly in a surveyor from the States uh, for a one day survey, but COVID, COVID quarantine made this far more difficult. This is hence why I spent six weeks in Grenada after the family had flown home. The survey went through as expected, and after a small renegotiation on price, the boat sale was completed and passed over to the new owners. That's it. It was over. Our caravan sailing adventure was done. Years of lead up to an adventure of a lifetime. But wait, there's still more. Order now and you'll also get this carry bag, yours to keep. Okay, well, there's kind of more. I will now load a few short videos about Grenada and the longer underwater TV video. I'll then do up a final thoughts on cruising video before we decide if we continue the videos with the next boating project. Let me know below if you have any questions um, if you, that you'd like answered in this final thoughts on cruising video. It's been a long one, so thanks for watching.